Hello, my name is Anthony. I'm from, as Lee said, I'm from BBC Radio Norfolk. I present the Sunday Breakfast Show. I'm also the assistant editor, so uh, as a manager, I work six days a week. I know, incredible uh, to have that. But uh, we, when Lee and I first talked about this and talked about the, the subject, actually from, from my own point of view, I was absolutely fascinated with it. We talk about a whole variety of these kind of subjects and, and public life and being kind and being faithful, not necessarily full of faith and how that actually shapes people's beliefs and, and strong health convictions. So I couldn't wait to speak to Sal. Now, I've got to get this right, and I've got to check that the CV is right, because we have a shared history somewhere, don't we? Um, because uh, you are obviously president of the UK Liberal Democrats, uh, Christian Blind Mission and UNICEF Director and Trustee. No longer Christian Blind Mission, but I was, yes. But was there. Um, started, though, in the BBC, I understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, programmes-wise, um, feel free to say, ooh, at any moment. So, Play School? Yes. Um, Grandstand? Yes. And Doctor Who? Yes. I'm <laughs> greatly intrigued by this. <laughs> this sounds marvellous. But actually, starting off um, wanting to be a stage manager. And that was my job at the BBC. I was a floor manager. Um, just a slight terminology change, because you don't have stages in television. You have studio floors. Um, but I had trained as a stage manager and then went to the BBC. Um, and when you learn your craft, you are put on every show imaginable, including Top of the Pops. I was the only young floor manager who said, having done my Top of the Pops, that's enough, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, the producer said, um, oh, OK, so what, 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 would, what do you prefer to do? And I said, if there's other music, classical, I'm, I'm happy with that. My now husband... Um, and you then worked at the Royal Opera House. And uh, so I got put on um, Stravinsky's Les Knockers, because the crew didn't know how to say it. Of course, Les Nos. Uh, <laughs> but it did mean that the other young floor managers got more goes at Top of the Pops, which they were really pleased about. <laughs> now, I'm already slightly in awe due to the fact that Sal worked in television, and I'm still in radio. As you can see, I have the perfect face for radio. Um, it works wonderfully every time, whereas Sal clearly has the face for television. Let's start straight at the heart of this. Can you be kind in public life? Oh, yes, you can. Um, we are losing the knack, unfortunately, um, but it is certainly possible. And I think the easiest thing for us to remember just at the moment are the tributes to Tessa Jowell, who died a fortnight ago. Universally, cross-party, hard-nosed political journalists all talked about her kindness to everybody she came across. So I think having taken the individual example, uh, can you then say, actually, it's universal? And I would say that in the political world, because I don't think we should just focus on politicians, it's much wider than that, there is a considerable amount of kindness, but it's down at the direct contact level. And I think what has changed in public life is the discourse where it has now become acceptable that if you don't agree with someone you become extremely vociferous to the point of not just unkind, but intimidation. And that certainly worries me. In fact, today, um, Demos, which is a cross-party think tank, have published a report called The Optimism Project. And, and forgive me for reading this, but they start off, living in a world of outrage, political discourse is dominated by division, resentment, and hostility. There is a growing sense of anger and and I'm afraid I think that is very true in political engagements, whether it's public to politicians, politicians to politicians, or I'm afraid to say public to public as well, where people disagree. And do you think that has increased, or has it always been there? I think it's increased substantially over the last five years. Um, and I think part of that has been the polarisation of politics. And the previous leader of the Liberal Democrats, um, Tim Farron, I thought articulated it very well. And it's a, a nastier side of populism where you polarise absolutely into the fours and against. And if you're not in my camp, I have the right to be offended by what you say and I have the right to tell you about it on my terms. And I don't believe that that was true I don't believe it was true even going back to the early days of the Tony Blair government and Iraq. People objected 
but you didn't get the personal vitriol that we're seeing now, which is appalling. And as a result, the Committee for Standards in Public Life actually had a report on intimidation of candidates in the last election because it has now become so bad. Well, let's look at, for example, um, Barry Black, the, 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 yes. the, the SNP, yes. who, who was attacked. Um, quite horrific things said to these people. You, mm. you belong in nappies. You, you shouldn't yes. be here. You should be back at school. Do you, you know, yes. do your parents are here. But actually, some of that, we're actually only scratching the surface of what some politicians are actually being, t what they're actually hearing, what, they're being, what is being said to them, and quite often from behind the comfort of a computer screen. It's often, um, certainly, you know, you're hidden by the screen, whether it's computer or phone. I mean, I've, I've been on the receiving end of it as well. Any politician does, even um, last week when I hit a problem with a train service and I was trolled for 26 hours by one individual who said that disabled people shouldn't behave like victims and mums with buggies should have rights over us people. And he just went on and on and on. I got to the point where it was clear that he was doing it for entertainment purposes, so I just stopped responding. But other people came in, both friends of mine who were upset, but also other disabled people who continued to say, to try and be reasonable and say, look, hang on, the law is very clear about why disabled people need priority. And we're not saying mums have to be thrown off buses, and in fact, that's not what this is about. But the nature and the tone was a constant egging on to try and get us to fight back. And that is very depressing. You need resilience to be able to, to deal with that. When I first stood for Parliament, um, the, first, the worst thing that happened to you was, you know, you might get heckled at hustings, but now it's day in, day out. Um, a friend of mine, and it's public, so she won't mind me saying, who stood in Edinburgh was, um, it was exactly this time last year because it was immediately after the, the Manchester bombings. Um, her political opponents, supporters, came out and said, there is a campaign lull as a mark of respect and Christine Jardine was out on the streets of Edinburgh West. This is an absolute disgrace. And um, Christine didn't reply, but her office did and said, actually, she's not. We know where she is, and actually, you know where she is. Please, can you stop this? It went on for three hours, and even though we asked um, her party's office to stop it, they wouldn't do it. The reason we knew it wasn't her was that she was at her husband's funeral, and the opposition knew it. It was awful really dreadful, designed to upset not just her but her team and they came through it very well. This isn't just about my team, mm -hmm. I'm afraid it happens across party support. It's not, it's not an edifying sight in politics today. So if you have that kind of attack, that kind of person there, you clearly have to harden yourself, you have to toughen yourself. Mm -hmm. So how can you also show kindness? If, if you're having to have this protective shell around you, no matter what political colour you are, ha in, in some people's eyes, the kindness would be seen as weakness. There's, a, there's two sorts of kindness. There's the kindness that we imagine at a one-to-one -one level with someone that we we know or we may not know but we come across I mean that close to us where we want to be kind there's another kindness which is not rising to that bait that I was talking about just now uh, and one of the things that we do in my party is we train our candidates for resilience and part of that is putting on this shell um, in fact I, I mean there are descriptions in the Bible about putting on a cloak in various forms I think this is a political cloak where you put it on because you know, if you can understand, that it's not you, the individual, that they're getting at. It's you, that public persona. Then you can have that shell and you can get on with it. Then the, the biblical side of kindness is to continue to be reasonable. Um, Paul, in his list of the many traits that Christians have to demonstrate, talks about the whole gamut of things, about honesty, about patience, he talks about kindness as well, and it's about that repetition, the, 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 the gentle assertiveness, I think I would probably describe it in management terms these days, 
to continue to try to put your point. But I'm afraid there comes a point when you can't, you just can't do it. And in terms of kindness, the example I always try and use is, we all know the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, but what we can't do is take it out of context of what Jesus said immediately before and immediately after. When the young supplicant came to him and asked what he needed to do. And Jesus asked him to tell him what it said in the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then go and do likewise, Jesus says immediately afterwards. And it's that faith in action in politics. is about how you try to live your life by those standards. And in the middle you have this wonderful story about the equivalent of high profile politicians of the day in the Good Samaritan just walked on the other side and didn't do it. So for me, it's a really salutary lesson about how we actually have to live that. We, we may be able to say the words at the beginning, but unless we've carried it through with those actions afterwards, then actually we've failed. You mentioned there about preparing people to take on the role of an MP or take on that public life and put on that shell or put on that cloak. There must be, though, so many individuals who can't take that off because of what they've received. So, so those, those softer emotions, th those emotions of kindness, of love, of compassion, must get buried under that cloak at some times. I mean, we think about what we see at, as the public are at House of Commons at Prime Minister's Question Time, and we see the pantomime that goes on. And there are so many layers of those cloaks how on earth can that kind of come out? And yet, going back to Tessa Jell, or one of those moments where we had the, 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 the first sitting after the Manchester Arena attacks, yes. the first sitting after um, the Westminster, Westminster, Westminster Bridge, and it changed, and you saw politicians remove those cloaks of, of yes. all parties. Yes. But doesn't it get buried sometimes completely? And how do you... how? How does a politician dare to show that? So I like your description of a pantomime with, with Prime Minister's Question Time. Um, often on social media you see complaints about the House of Commons being empty when there are debates going on. Um, but what the public don't see is everything that's happening elsewhere in the building. And that's when the cross-party collegiate working happens. That's where the kindness is, where the relationships are built up and the kindnesses happen. Uh, the all-party parliamentary groups where people come together regardless of party. In fact, you cannot set one up unless you've got people from at least three parties involved and preferably more. Uh, those are where I think the real work happens. And the Prime Minister's Question Time is a particular problem because it, it is a pantomime. I have, I, and I know Jeremy Corbyn has said this, Fergus Cable said this, Tim Farron said this, I remember Nick Clegg saying it, Theresa May said it. As they all become leaders, they say, we're going to change Prime Minister's question time, and it doesn't change. By the way, it's much worse if you're in the chamber than it is on television. <laughs> How so? Paint us a picture. What you don't get in, on television is the sense of bombardment from the other side. doesn't matter which side, but from the other side. So you hear on television the cat calls... Um, you know, the but also the no, no, no is going on. But the way the acoustics work in the chamber, if it's you that's standing up and trying to speak, it's absolute volume coming in at you. And you have to learn that cloak of how to continue to ask your question. Because one of the reasons it happens is that the side opposite to yours are trying to discourage you and put you off because that would be a victory for their side. And yes, it is childish. And part of the problem is the way our chamber is shaped. It's confrontational. You're either on one side or the other. If you look at all the modern parliaments, they're um, hemicircles. You think about the European Parliament, the Scottish Parliament, Congress in America. You don't sit opposite each other. You don't attack each other in the same way. It is, it is a completely different atmosphere. I can certainly vouch for the noise having sat in the public gallery myself. It is an incredibly noisy, riotous atmosphere. But on those moments where politicians of all sides come together to talk about an event, to talk about a moment, to, to talk about the kindness, 
And as you say, that goes on elsewhere in the building. Mm. Why don't we see that? I think you do see it. I just think that you don't see it on the news because uh, I'm going to sound as if I'm attacking our media and I'm not. News is about telling stories. They tell very few good stories. And Tessa Jowell's last appearance in The Lords was one of the cases in point where, and that was lovely. It was a, a wonderful thing to see. But in the main, the news is made by controversy and difficulty. So that's why the public doesn't see it. But if you are enthusiastic enough about our democracy, come and sit in public galleries in both the Commons and the Lords. Uh, we operate in a very different way in the Lords, completely, completely different. I mean, it isn't tough, um, but it's there. And it's particularly there in the, I mean, Parliament comes from medieval French. And those of you who have done French will know it comes from parler, 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 to talk. So, and it is the place where you come together to talk, to create legislation. And we make legislation by talking arguments at each other, discuss, and in the committee stage and report stage of most bills, actually you hear people jumping up and saying, so am I understanding this right? And, and that's the tone they use. It's not confrontational. It's really trying to get to understand why this bit of the amendment is important. What is it about this phrase that is needed instead of what has been drafted by the government in the bill? And I think that displays a kindness, a genuine, I may not agree with you, but I'm trying to understand your point of view. There is plenty of that that happens. You mentioned earlier about the, the five years ago when things change and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that the rise of social media that you feel has changed the atmosphere for politicians? I think social media is the mechanism, but I don't think that's the case. I'm trying, I'm trying to think about, um, using Tim Farron's analogy about populism, um, it's the, the rise of people, and I'm, I'm deliberately not saying party, who were deeply unhappy with what was going on in Europe and indeed at Westminster as well, and the desire to have a solution, the solution being for many of these people coming out of Europe. Uh, but there are others as well. Um, it was the end of the Labour era, 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 I'm sort of talking about the beginning of the, that, that, when people were very unhappy after 13 years of a Labour government. Mm -hmm. And it was that polarisation that really started to happen then the rise of UKIP, the rise of the conservative view, fueled that into a debate about whether we should have a referendum or not. In 2012 and 13, when we started to debate the process about whether we should have a, a referendum and what that referendum should say, the tone was still all right. But it was five years ago, as we were leading up to the last European elections, when it suddenly became very difficult. and. Um, I, and I, I, I must be fair about this because I think it's both sides. I think it's polarising. I have no idea how people in this hall are watching this view, but it is the division between those who voted Remain and those who voted Leave is, believe it or not, at the moment, the biggest division in our country. Um, YouGov, I think it's YouGov, does a poll every month on how would you vote if there was an election tomorrow, who is your favourite leader? Who is your least favourite? And then they ask you five questions on topics such as immigration, the NHS, the economy, jobs, are you worried about your jobs? And are, in the run-up to the referendum, they started to ask, are you going to vote remain or leave? And they've kept that in there because the country is just as polarised as it was. There is then another question that they ask, which is a much softer one, which is, Let's just assume that you are somebody who uh, voted to leave Europe because you were most worried about immigration and freedom of movement. Um, so they would then say, your son or daughter comes home and announces that they've got engaged to a Croatian nurse. And then you rank that about how upset you are and then they do it for all the other key issues that worry you. Remain and leave beats immigration, concern about the NHS, concern about jobs, concern about poverty, all of those, it is more polarising for us as society two years on from a referendum. And I don't believe that that's purely 
about the issue. I think it's about where, whether people believe that democracy is working for them, whether they understand what politicians are doing. I think that's our fault because people clearly don't. But underlying that has this been, been this change about, if you offend me, I have a right to say, that's appalling, 10 years ago. I don't believe we were saying that. It was quite rare to have that. So I think that has been a change. On the flip side of the polarisation of people's views, though, you talked about Tessa Jell, but actually take Joe Cox, mm. take possibly some people in this room, maybe not, I didn't do it, but I'm sure somebody did suddenly put an ice bucket over their head and and uh, drenched themselves in ice in order to raise it. And all that was done through social media. Mm. Joe Cox, the, the reason why people had so many parties out in the street was because a social media campaign started. And yes. people said, that's wrong. We need to stand up to this. We, we need to be kind. So mm. it can divide. It can be a dark place. But equally, a huge force Absolutely. for good. Absolutely. I think, I think it can. I think one of the great things that happened at the beginning of Lent this year on social media was sign up for a random act of kindness every day. Uh, I don't know how many people did in the end, but I have a number of friends who did. I tried to do it. I won't say I would succeed it every day, but actually I, having to think, actually the key thing is the random part of that. Uh, and um, I'm just so I can get it right, I'm going to get the, the quote right. Um, Wordsworth said something really lovely about how you recognise the end of, of, uh, of somebody's life. Um, and I can't find my bit of paper. So here we are. I, I'm, going to, I, I'm going to have to look for it because if I get it wrong, I will ruin the verse and it's rather beautiful. Let me come back to that. Yes. Uh, but I think there are things that are here. That best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts or kindness. <coughs> and the love, I think, for us as Christians is also important. You mentioned about um, nowadays what's actually happening in terms of MPs <coughs> trying to show emotion and being shouted down for it. But you said that wasn't always the case. Mm. Is that true, though? Or was it just simply there weren't the mechanics to shout that person down? But in, in, the, in an MP's life as a whole, do you think it was easier in past times to show emotion, to show kindness, to show what you believed? I th Actually, it's a very interesting question because my father was an MP for some years. Mm. Um, Conservative MP between 1979 to 1987. So, I mean, he saw some interesting times when he was in Parliament. But he was also a broadcaster. Uh, he, uh, he was an actor, journalist, and, and then an ITN newscaster for some years. Um, he said when he first went into Parliament, what really shocked him was that there was no display of emotion. But because he had been trained as an actor, and, and he, he conveys passion in the way he, he spoke very well, um, people had talked about how unusual it was in the early 80s to have an MP being able to express some of those, those emotions and to express it well. Uh, and I think these days, it isn't just about the aggression or the difficult things. What really has changed in the last five years has been when MPs and peers speak about something that is a very personal experience, um, wonderful debates about some of our women MPs losing babies, some of our male MPs talking about their wives losing babies as well. Um, I uh, had a stalker, a political stalker for some years, and I decided that I was going to speak about that, and all my colleagues came and sat around me while I gave my speech, because they knew it was, I mean, I'm emotional again about it now, it was the first time I had talked publicly about it since it had happened. And those are the sorts of acts of kindness that you wouldn't see at all because you wouldn't wonder why there were people sitting around. But it was quite deliberate, quite kind, and the responses of ministers to MPs who talk very personally about what's happened to them, it has also been kind. You just see the, the, the party politics drop away. But we don't forget why those speeches are being made. 
there is still a political with a small p end to it. It might be changing the law about um, allowances for families after a child has died. In my case, it was the beginning of a campaign to, to change the law on stalking. We succeeded. Um, we're there to change the law. So I think there is now more emotion on both sides. I welcome some of that. The difficult part, the aggression, I'm afraid, I, I just, I don't know how we are going to change that. Probably not without a new style of chamber, and that is not going to happen. <laughs> Outside of Westminster, though, society is changing. We are, we are seeing kindness, emotion being displayed far more than, than ever we would because people feel able to talk out. I think about the Me Too campaign mm. and women feeling absolutely empowered to speak out, to say no, and to support each other mm -hmm. and to show that. We wouldn't have seen that even, I'd say, 10 or even 20 years ago. That wouldn't have I, th that I think you're right. No, I think you're right. And I think that is... Um, the Me Too campaign has, has been a really powerful um, um, articulation of that, but I've seen it in other ways as well. I, and I do think it's important because whether it's about sex harassment, whether it's about race discrimination, whether it's conscious or unconscious discrimination, whether it's just about plain hurtful things being said, whether it's about disability discrimination, which I've been on the end of, you know, hate crimes at a train station, um, Actually, the one thing you need is somebody else to stand up alongside you, to challenge courteously, and in social media terms, standing up alongside you is doing hashtag me too. But just stepping forward and saying, can I help here? Or I'm not sure you're aware of what, how hurtful what you said was, is much more powerful than the person who it has been said to, having to deal with it themselves, because it's terribly emotional. I mean, I will tell you, I will tell you my story very quickly. Um, I went to the wide aisle to come out of uh, my, my usual station, Euston, and a woman in front of me was talking on the phone, refusing to go through. I think she was having an argument with her mother. Uh, and she turned around, she started to shout at me, and then she tried to kick me. And then she went through and disappeared. And I, I can't believe it. And at that point, four people came up to me and said, are you all right? Are you okay? And... With hindsight, it would have been lovely if they'd just come up to her and said, you know, is there a problem? Can we, can we help? What can we do to help? Because it would have just helped diffuse it, whereas I was, was thrown back. Now, we didn't find who, whoever it was. The British Transport Police, when they looked at the video, were appalled at what she'd done. But it was somebody there who said, you need to report this. I just shrugged. I thought, you yeah, know, I'll just go to work. I've got to go to work today. I'll just put it behind me. Actually, it needed to be recorded because we needed the police to understand that things like this happen. And it happens across the board in many other areas. So my plea, my public plea, is don't be afraid to step in. I mean, obviously, one has to be careful with people who might be violent, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about actually supporting people who are on the, on the end of it. And for those of you on social media, that includes that as well. We've seen it huge rise in that right across society. I think in in the wake of the various terror attacks, there have mm. been so many people, we, we've seen images on, on YouTube where people are being harassed on a train who look like a Muslim. And I can't put it any other mm. simple way that, people ha that, that, that that person is being targeted because they look like a Muslim, according to that person. Mm. And you can see people around them saying, no, the, this isn't right. I'm going to support this person. I, I'm, I'm, I'm standing up. And part of that is kindness. Part of that is, it's not just about standing up for what's wrong. It's saying, I want to be kind to this person. Yes. And, and I see this person as being somebody who I need to be with to support. So that emotion is coming through society. So how long before that penetrates Western? Well, I think, it, I, I think Westminster is as much society as anywhere else. And I think um, it, this is about when people, and I, I don't mean politicians, I mean people, switch into politics in their brain, and it's as if the rule book's been thrown out of the window. Um, and I, mean, I, I went to a hustings last month in, in my hometown in Watford, and I was really quite shocked at the 
not just the questions, but the tone of some of the questions at this hustings to, to two of the candidates who weren't from the party that the, the other person was supporting. It, it, it can be vicious stuff. And the answer is we have to, we have to have, I think we have to enshrine the right to, to it's okay to be offended. Um, oh, and by the way, Australia, Shirley Williams told me this, some years ago, Australia created a, um, a law against offence, taking offence. And the sad thing is that Christians of different denominations were going to other denominations, sitting in the back of the pew, and then being offended and reporting people for being offended, feeling that the, what was being said was offensive. As a result, Australia got rid of the law. <laughs> it didn't last terribly long, but it was as if it was giving people permission to be offended, and if you enshrine it in law, it then made it something special. And I think that's, that's without us having a law, I think that that's what's happened with us, particularly over um, the idea of Brexit. I don't, think, I don't think Brexit is really it. I think there's a lot more. It's about polarisation in society, lots of different things, um, which is just, we've got to start a dialogue. It comes back to this Demos report that came out today. One of the ways of doing it is partly through kindness, and the other is through optimism, that when you talk to someone, you reach out and seek to understand rather than say, I disagree with you and I, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Um, that is a duty that we all have. It's strange that I remember my parents both saying that uh, getting a mobile phone or getting a computer would be the, the, the death of kind of talking to people and, and engaging in conversation. And yet it doesn't seem to have done that. There are, there are lots of dialogues being opened up with people, lots of people talking to people. As long as it's uh, 280 characters. Of course, or less, of course. <laughs> but, the, but, there is, but there is a moment of, are we just changing how we're doing that? Because there was, this, there were, there was the, the definite thought of, right, we, we will no longer have neighbours. We won't talk over the fence anymore like we used to. And yet, again, when... when when things are happening, when there are major events, we see people opening doors. Manchester being a good example. Cab drivers giving free rides home. People opening their doors randomly. Uh, the, the, the London attacks. Random strangers going home with random strangers because we know you haven't got a bed, just come and stay at ours. So those dialogues and that kindness are, Absolutely, yeah. are Absolutely. still going on and actually nothing has changed that. It's still... When you're dealing with one-on-one, -on -one, mm. like you and me, mm. it's very different. It is absolutely different. And I think I was there in Westminster on the day of the Westminster Bridge um, horrors. And I think since then, the relationship between parliamentarians and the staff, particularly the police and the security people who keep us safe, has changed. It's really changed. You cannot spend five hours locked in rooms with other people because you believe that there's somebody in the building who is just looking to gun you down without changing that relationship. And that's a good thing. We were far too divided before. Um, and one of the things that, that we've, in Christian politics we've been trying to do um, is we, we have, uh, the Christians in Parliament group meets, we have lots of events, but it tends to be parliamentarians and their parliamentary staff we've actually now started to expand that a bit and ensure that other staff know that they are genuinely welcome. So we're, we're hoping that that will really start to take off. But that, that becomes important in lots of different ways. Just see that the, the relationship with staff has changed. It's interesting that that's actually happened out of something so dark so and horrific yes. that those barriers have been broken down. Well, you only have to think of that picture of an MP trying to save the life of a policeman, there were no barriers. There were no barriers at all. Everybody was working for the same end. And I think that was a very powerful message to us. Could you today, as a young MP, stand up for kindness and go to your local party? your local debates, to your hustings, 
do you think it is possible for an MP to say, I'm going to stand for kindness? I think most of our MPs do. Our current 650 MPs. I'm not being party pre about this at all. Most of the MPs that I know are kind people. They're in the job for the right reasons. They may get swept up with some of the party stuff at the Prime Minister's question time. But if you talk to them about the commun their communities, they are passionate about what goes on in their communities. And quite often you'll find there's cross-party working. Now, I'm working with a group of Conservative MPs in Hertfordshire um, over an issue about a closure of a day centre for the most disabled children in Hertfordshire. We don't look at the party side of that at all. Um, we're working with the families, which I think you'd probably describe as, you know, the, that's the easy part to do. But we're also working with the county council and we're working with the people in the health authorities as well, as well as the Department of Health and Ministry. And actually, when you do that and you're, you're really fighting to help something that you absolutely believe in, this, your start point is kindness and thoughtfulness and understanding. So Conservative MPs, who I didn't know particularly well, stop in the corridor and chat to that, that's a very visible sign of that kindness working. So it doesn't disappear because I think all, all of us think that all the it, it's like a politician's promises as soon as they step into the House of Commons or the House of Lords somehow those get lost in everything else you have to do I always think of yes minister or, or yes prime minister once you've done your boxes then you can actually do the things that you always wanted to do um so I had a victory in the Lords today um, where, um, I don't know if you've read anything in the last week, one of the large train operating companies has decided to change its advice to staff about putting people, disabled people onto trains. And we're not people, by the way, we are PRMs, people with reduced mobility. Uh, and if the train is likely to be delayed by you putting that person on the train, you must not do it. So this was formal guidance to staff that came out a week ago. And over the last four or five days, I've been working with ministers behind the scenes, two ministers in the Lords, and I know that uh, people down the end have been doing this well. And today I asked a question, and the minister stood up and said, um, what this document says is insensitive, and it's completely unacceptable, and the firm are now going back, and they're going to start again on the document to give a guidance to staff. Um, that sort of working has been cross-party. Uh, and, and, and it's not just cross-party. Um, a union that I would not normally say I was particularly uh, close to working with, the RMT union, have been absolutely key in giving disabled people the information they need to challenge this. But the ministers were genuinely horrified when they read what was being proposed. So the minister who made the announcement in the Lords today was blunt absolutely blunt and he came up to me afterwards and said was was that okay and do you think the message has got through that we take this very seriously now the whole question session lasted seven minutes myself and then other people asked the question gone in a flash but actually behind the scenes ministers had run the train company and they got change to happen that's kindness they didn't have to do that they could have just read the words, got on with things, but they actually went and bothered. And I have to say that's pretty close to the norm. I mean, obviously, when you're doing polarised things like the EU withdrawal bill, you know, when stances are taken, and I'm not talking about that, but things like this, where small changes start to make a lot of difference for people's lives. Ministers, they really do care. And we have seen that. I, I think back to 2000, with the massive campaign to the Jubilee year mm. to, to free third world debt mm. and we did it and somehow that I don't think the first thought was justice it was about being kind and being fair and being and doing the right thing yes. so there are examples in history where kindness and emotion you feel emotionally drawn to a campaign where that has actually happened yes absolutely and that's also part of the role of Parliament, is to draw out those examples to stop legislation looking dry as dust on the page. Um, now, we've chosen ones that I would describe as 
you know, highly emotive because they're, they're about visible ways of people living their lives. But I hear some of my colleagues talking about really dry legal things, but they manage to make it human by giving examples, and they help to sway the debate and, and, and the argument um, to get change where change is needed. So it, it, it can happen in any area at all. Oh, goodness me, it's just gone dark. <laughs> When are we going to see that tip over? In terms, of the, in terms of the news, in terms of actually seeing that as a part of regular political life? I think it will continue to happen as we have single events that horrify us. Um, anybody who has been to Manchester in the last year knows that Manchester... It's not that Manchester has changed because the people of Manchester are an extraordinary community. They really identify as a community. Um, but I was there in April, and they talk about it. They talk about the way it's changed. Wearing that little B pin, absolutely they are part of it, and they are determined to make things change. I'm sure we don't need incidents like that all over the country. I think the big issue of Brexit is probably going to have to be resolved, whichever way it's resolved, before we start to make a change on many things. I also think we are going to need a new generation of leaders. Um, the people who are leaders at the moment, the discourse is really quite difficult. And although all new leaders come in and say, I'm going to do it differently, the reality is if you're going to get coverage and all leaders need coverage, then often that, that tone starts to change. So much for having a conversation with me, and thank you for being so open and honest and sharing some of your very personal moments uh, with the people here. Thank you very much. Thanks for asking. You finished uh, talking about tone, and um, I think that's uh, when you talk about confrontational tone and the, uh, the general sort of argy-bargy. Um, uh, I wonder if we could explore that a bit further. People, members of the public, do have different tones and different ways of expressing themselves. Um, having been a, a local government councillor myself, I've been on the receiving end of a lot of this sort of tone. Uh, sometimes it's been constructive, sometimes it's been very confrontational. Um, I, I've always really liked it to the, uh, what goes on in TV soap operas, which, uh, um, you know, one episode after another is, is, is very confrontational. And uh, say at a public meeting or somebody's asking you a question, they seem to have to reflect that type of tone, that, that sort of battling um, demeanour in order to make what they want to say credible. If they were gentle and reasonable, it wouldn't have the same impact at a public meeting. It's got to be, you know, really full in your face. Um, but I, I think, I don't know whether that's always been the case, but it is something you have to learn to manage. And the people at the other end who are giving you this bad tone, let's say, we consider we might consider it bad tone, um, are still people. And basically, you might have to ask, you, well, what's your problem? You don't ask them what, you have to try to guess what their problem is. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I don't know what, what you like to reflect on, on tone, because you talked about that. And in doing so, the, uh, we did open up, we talked about popularism. Well, of course, um, uh, MPs and councillors and others um, have to be popular, because otherwise they wouldn't get elected. There's nothing wrong being popular. Uh, you wouldn't be otherworldly. You've got to be a man or a woman of the people, let's say, in order to reflect their views. So I've got an issue also with popularism. It's not necessarily all that bad. We might see it in Italy, for instance, right wing and left wing. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering if it's the wrong word. Because um, I'm all for being popular because it shows that you're reflective of society's views. 
I, I'm very grateful for your... I mean, the point about soap operas is absolutely well made, and um, I think there are reality TV shows that use the same style, uh, and young people's magazines as well. Um, so I, I absolutely take that point, and I think that's why this sort of resilience and assertiveness that just tries to unpack why somebody is so distressed and angry when they come to you and see you as being the cause of a problem. I was a counsellor for 11 years, so I absolutely understand where you're coming from. Um, and I think it is incumbent on political parties to, to train councillors and candidates for parliament in how to manage that to help diffuse, to actually get to the bottom of the problem. Because otherwise, as, as you will know, with casework, people just pour out anger, wrath with the system, you're part of the system because you're a counsellor, and you're trying to get to the nub of what the issue is to see if you can help. I always say that polit well, politicians are um, emotion um, drain unblockers yeah. uh, because people come because you are the last bit of the system that they can come to for help. And if extremely upset and emotional, and of course they get angry. The issue about populism, I think... Um, I mean something different to you. One, certainly, one has to be popular enough to be able to win a vote. I think I'm talking about the sort of thing that we've seen with Trump in America, with Orban in Hungary, where they are playing to a very particular, nasty populism, which is about identifying one group, and if you're in it, you're fine, and if you're not, we don't want you. Um, in, case, in the case of Hungary, I mean, Orban was originally a liberal. He was a, he was a member of ALDE, which is the, the organization for liberal parties across Europe, which I'm a member as well, um, and probably Felicity is too, simply because she's a member of the, the Liberal Democrats. But he is now espousing politics in the way that Hitler did in the 30s. It is about exclusion. They literally have built a wall for, I think it's 120 kilometers to prevent people, refugees, trying to come across the border on the route to get to Germany. Um, there are some extremely unpleasant anti-Semitic things happening in, in Hungary. Um, George Soros, who is Hungarian, has essentially been hounded into exile. That's the sort of populism I mean. And I think Trump, we can see it with all the dialogue about you know, the wall on, on, on the boundary to Mexico. That is a very visible wall. But it's not just that. It's also about walls within communities. So it's no surprise um, that black communities in the southern states of America are concerned because they now have a president who talks to the Ku Klux Klan. Extreme concern about populism. I think it's that that really worries me. Um, there was a UKIP poster just before the referendum. Do you remember that one about free borders and we don't want all these people coming into our country? And the line of refugees, actually that was taken in Turkey, not in England, but it looked as if it was on our borders. That's nowhere close to what I've described in either America or Hungary, but it is very dangerous populism. But on a very simplistic level, those people are connected with people. Mm. Somehow and somewhere, whatever we may think about those views, somewhere that is striking a chord with people. Does, does that go back to the, to the sort of the angriness, the wanting yes. to be confrontational with people? I, th I, think, I think it's anger. I don't think it's wanting to be confrontational, but it's a real anger, a concern about jobs. Um, and then listening to, the, listening to the words that are most in tune with what you're thinking and then ticking that box. I had a, a, a bizarre conversation um, about eight months after the referendum uh, with a sheep farmer in Cumbria. Another of my colleagues was also a sheep farmer. Um, we, were, we were chatting and he said, oh, I voted Brexit, I voted Brexit because I'm just so fed up with the, the payments to farms uh, that comes from the EU because it's a complete mess. And a colleague said, but that comes from Westminster. That's done through DEFA, that's not done through Europe. It's delegated to our government. And the man said, oh my goodness, I did this in order to give more power to the people I actually want to complain about. And I thought, you're a farmer, you should know where this money comes from. 
But he was so angry in his mind, the problem was entirely about those farm payments. And I don't know where, what, what he thinks you know, 18 months on, but um, I suspect he's getting cross because the threat now is there won't be any payments for farmers in the future. It's been interesting as you've talked about uh, kindness and you've given us uh, quite a number of personal examples or of examples of people that you know about. Could you comment on what you think the relationship is between moral courage and kindness? Do we, do we need to actively stand up for that which we know is good? Is it a concept or an understanding, A, as Christians, uh, an experience of that which is good, which stands under kindness? Good question. Um, and the easy answer is, yes, of course we should. Think of people like Bonhoeffer, who made the ultimate sacrifice in standing up. Um, I was caught short in a debate I was having with, with some colleagues the other day uh, uh, about this, um, who said, we all say we would stand up, but the reality is, until other people have stood up, most of us won't be the first to stand up. And I think, for me, that certainly was a moment when I thought, I know there are things I would always intervene on because I'm passionate about them, but there are others I might think, no, I'm not, not too happy about that. You know, When you have a taxi driver who says something that's absolutely racist, and you think, well, I've only got three minutes to the end, I just won't say anything. You know, as a result of that debate, I'll actually now simply think, do you really mean that? Do you really, really mean that? Do you not have any friends who are from the, in this case, it was about um, knife crime in the young Afro-Caribbean community in South London, mm -hmm. where he came from, and he was you know, sort of blaming the community for this. Actually, I, I think that is the sort of kindness where we can stand up. It's not easy, because you have to very quickly formulate your arguments for a reasoned discussion and stop the polarizing debate. But yes, we do need to, and I think it is a form of kindness. I think that's, it's, it's interesting when you say about sort of having that moral courage and whether actually young people now more and more we're seeing them say I don't think that's right I don't agree with that and they are much more likely to say to somebody hang on I just want to pull you up on that so as you say there are there is still that moment of standing forward of standing out in that spotlight but do you think it's becoming easier because people are prepared now to put themselves I, I think you're right and I think you're right about young people doing it from, you know, from all walks of life and if that's our future then that's, you know, that's a really optimistic thing to hold on to and think about and I think part of the problem is for, for those of us I'm over 60, for those of us over 60 uh, we were always told not to offer you know, views to people you didn't know, it's not very nice to, to challenge people um, when you thought that something had been said that was was, I mean, wrong, seriously wrong. I don't mean disagreeing politically with somebody, I mean intervening in something, uh, because you, you actually think that it's, it's not a kind thing to say, nor is it right. But no, I think we do need to do it. And, and unbutton ourselves a bit at our great age. <laughs> I'll try and be coherent, but I'm not known for it. Um, I'm interested if you think if kindness is a sort of inherent property or an emergent property, because uh, it's often said um, attack is the best form of defence. And so I wonder if you think that the society or the world is a lot more of a fearful place these days, because suicide, especially young males, is on the increase, self-harm. So I just wonder, in amongst the, the discussion, where you feel this sort of um, details fit in, particularly around the fear element. Because you said that things worry you. I just wonder if you feel as though the scale of worry 
is larger now than it has been a decade, let's say, ago. We know that to be the case, certainly amongst young people. Uh, there is much evidence um, polling amongst young people, particularly amongst students, um, to, to show that that's the case. And um, I'm not sure that I would take the um, inherent and the, or the emergent. I think everyone has kindness within them, but as with other skills, sometimes we have to learn to make it visible. It's a sort of comp a competency, isn't it, to, uh, to ourselves, which is not to say I'm going to be kind, but it's just that part of the brain that says, is there something I can do here that will be helpful, and it may also be, be kind as well, um, which it could be, I saw somebody the other day, a young person on the train, hadn't got the fare, the person next to them said, that's right, I'll pay for you, don't worry. If you were my daughter, I'd be worried about that. Mm. So that, that's the sort of small act of kindness that for this young woman, she was really scared that she was going to be in deep trouble and she just left her purse at home, genuinely distressed. And I think that kindness is within us all. Do we recognise when we should use it? That's what we need to train a bit ourselves. A final question at all? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I just wondered whether you feel that um, our education system, whether it's our school system or even our university system, can help with this um, process of trying to inculcate kindness um, <clears throat> and actually encourage people to uh, learn how to relate to each other better? Yes, I think that, that's a very good question, but I think, if, but it's not starting now. Um, when I was Chair of Education in Cambridgeshire, uh, we were the first council to start anti-bullying technique training for teachers, I'm afraid I'm going back to 1993, a long time ago, um, because we recognised that bullying was was a problem that, that schools weren't particularly good at tackling. And I um, founded with another MP the uh, all-party parliamentary group for bullying. And over the last seven or eight years, we've had research commission and various other things. And the good news is that in schools that are aware of it and tackle it, the culture amongst young people to support each other is excellent. It really is good. And we have to recognise that, that bullying and harassment is going to go on everywhere. And it's not just young people, it happens in the workplace as well. And I think that's why the point that you were making about young people um, reaching out, supporting, I think we're seeing some of that work coming through from schools across the country as young people start to think about others perhaps more than, than we did. But there is a corresponding downside, which is part of this polarisation where it has become acceptable for young, really quite young children, to start attacking, hopefully just verbally, but not always, the other kids from other particular groupings. And that has become much more virulent and offensive. And the mental health effects on the children who are on the receiving end of that has been extremely tough. But we are now aware of it. I think 25 years ago, we, we just, we're not, we supposed, but the evidence is now there. Academic research, cyberbullying is a particularly nasty form of it. Um, having worked with the Diana Award and Facebook, it's not as easy as saying, well, we'll just create legislation around social media that will make it all right, mm -hmm. because it won't. Uh, there are things that can be done, uh, but that's one of the reasons why we have responsibilities as, as parents, in my case as a grandparent, um, to really make sure that we keep our children and grandchildren safe um, from this, which includes not allowing phones in bedrooms at night. Um, the worst bullying happens when adults have gone to bed and kids are on their own in their rooms with their phones. So there are practical things, but I think your, your question was not a practical one. Uh, so good and bad is the 